Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Well, today I have a special episode. I'm interviewing Gene Hanratty. He has read a book about each of the presidents, and I thought it'd be fun to get him on the episode and ask him questions about how he got the project started, how he chose his books, and some overall takeaways after reading a book about all the presidents. And so that's that's today's interview. Uh, in the show notes, I'll have a list of all the books that he read, so the book that he read about each of the presidents. I've known Gene since 2008, where I first met him, and I started doing website development for the Hong Kong Association of Atlanta, of which he was the senior consultant. And he has lived a full life. He uh, retired from the army with the rank of major after having tours of duty in Vietnam, Okinawa, and Korea. He was a master parachutist, and he was also qualified and served in units with the special forces and with the rangers. In fact, I once asked him for a book recommendation so I could better understand what his service would have been like during Vietnam. And the book he recommended was called SOG, uh, S-O-G, and that stands for Special Operations Group. And that was, he was, he was a part of SOG. And uh, I read that for my 2019 reading list as, as part of this project, but it, but it was neat to learn about that organization, uh, which had a huge influence on the, the Navy SEALs. And he was, he was at the forefront of that. He was, he was there at the beginning. So he has uh, uh, some amazing stories, uh, just a, a life well lived and, and fully lived. And uh, now he's, he's, he acts as almost an ambassador of sorts between the Atlanta community and a variety of international organizations. Uh, many of those organiza- organizations are, are Asian based. So we've come become good friends. And, and, and uh, during this time that he's been reading these books, I've, I've also often asked him about it. And and I've been very curious about it. So now I get to ask him the questions. You get to hear his responses. So let's let's get right into it. All right. Well, hi, Gene. Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast. Thanks, Eric. So we're going to talk about your big reading project. And I thought the best place to get going on that would be to, to have you describe the project and, you know, just from the beginning, the scope of it, why did you start? What made you do this? And, um, and then just go from there. So, so go ahead. Well, my, my presidential, uh, reading journey began in, I think it was 2011 when a friend gave me a cop, a book called uh, decision points by president Bush. And, uh, I, I didn't know at that time that that this adventure or this journey was going to happen. But after reading that, I happened to read uh, uh, s- some other presidential books, specifically uh, uh, the one ones by Doris Carnes Goodwin, and uh, it just sort of evolved from there. This friend, uh, who happens to be Eric Rostad. <laughs> said, well, Gene, since you're, you're doing that, why don't, why don't you just read a book about a, a biography about every president? And then it struck me that that, that would be, because I'm a bit of a history buff, especially American history, that it, it would certainly be an interesting perspective to, to see uh, the, the United States history from, from the White House itself. And what sort of, you know, made our history on a continuing type basis. So as I got into it, I said, well, where's, where do I want to start? I don't want to just keep picking books out hither and yon. So I said, let me start from when I was born. So this will date me, but that be that put me with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I started with Roosevelt went all the way forward uh, up to uh, Barack Obama. I'll be very honest and say I haven't read anything uh, about uh, President Obama or President Trump yet. Uh, I sort of want to wait a bit to 
to let some of their their history congeal before I could pick out anything that would, you know, give me a perspective uh, on on their presidencies. So yeah. I did that. I, I I went ahead and read everything going forward from uh, from President Roosevelt and got caught up. And then I said, okay, now we'll go back and start with George Washington. So I did that and came all the way forward. And uh, I guess it's taken me some uh, 10 years to, well, it's not complete. It's still a continuing uh, uh, process because I'm reading other books uh, about presidents that I've already read about. So uh, it, it just keeps going. You know, the, some have been very interesting. Some have been very dull. But uh, none, nonetheless, it, it, it has given me a much better appreciation for our, our, this experiment in democracy hmm. and, uh, and, and, and the adventure that it's been. And it's still an adventure right now, certainly, that yeah. we're living through. Wow. Um, f- so for the, for the books themselves, uh, how did you go about choosing them? And, and was there like, did you have a rule kind of a a set of rules set up to where you would start with if they had an autobiography and if they didn't have an autobiography, you would go to their biography. What what was the selection process for, for the books? Well, that sort of evolved also. Let me tell you what happened with that. Uh, I always, I I had some friends that said, uh, I said, Hey, I'm reading some books about presidents. And they'd say, Hey, well, well read, uh, John Meacham read, uh, 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 Schlesinger, you know, and they'd give me uh, ideas on books that they had read. And I went online then and uh, Googled and found different uh, sources. The uh, uh, New York Times and others put out recommended lists of biographies about presidents. Hmm. And then from that, I, I'd even go so far as to look up the president and all the biographies that might have writ- been written about him. And I'd see if there were any authors I'd like, and, and I'd look in and see if there were any blogs. There were blogs you can go to mm-hmm. uh, and uh, pick out what I thought was the best. Now, at times, the uh, book selection that I made uh, hit the target, but I think some... Well, I, after I finished the book and I said, geez, you know, I, that was bad. So, some presidents were really quite dull. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes the writing was of such an academic nature that it wasn't a fun read. I've, mm-hmm. I've enjoyed more of the books, the biographies that have been done that are, are tell it as sort of a story. You know, it, yeah. even if it's not... Uh, you know, with with responses from any of the characters involved in the administration, at least the story of the continuum of the history as they're going through their presidency. But then it evolved even further because I I happened to see that some of these books had uh, presidential autographs, uh, author autographs, and uh, I found myself looking for first editions. So I've, I've got a, I've run a full spectrum. I've got seven books with presidential autographs and another seven or so that have the author's autograph. And uh, for a couple of them, uh, they're autographed directly to me. Uh, I happened to attend a lecture that John Meacham gave here at the Carter Center. I live in Atlanta and uh, got him to autograph a copy of his book directly to me after his presentation. Wow. And I was so enthralled with Doris Carr's Goodwin that I knew she was from New England in the Boston area. And I can't remember exactly how I stumbled on it, but I hit upon a bookstore uh, where in the description of the bookstore, it, it was in one of the suburbs of Boston that she lived by and frequented. So I called the bookstore and asked if I could speak to the owner or, or the manager. 
And uh, I, I spoke to the manager and I said, here's what I'm trying to do. If I send you a copy of my book that I've read by, by Doris Carnes Goodwin, would, would you hold on to it and get it autographed for me? Oh, wow. And he said, well, I'd be happy to do that, but uh, help me out. What if I, what if I uh, just get her to autograph a, a new copy of, that I've got of it here and I can at least get a sale out of it? So we did that with one of the books, but for two of the others, he let me send them in because I said, no, I'd, I'd prefer to have these because yeah. uh, when I buy my books, I, I write in them a lot along the ledger because at some point in time, when I'm not here, I hope uh, one of my daughters or my sons takes this collection in toto and has it because uh, from from President Roosevelt going forward, they'll see footnotes that I put in there about uh, either my father, their grandfather, uh, maybe it'll even get to be great grandfather at some point in time. With, mm -hmm. Hey, this is interesting to know, you know, of what I thought about some episode in history or some character that I might have even had contact with. Wow. So it's, it's been very interesting. Now, oh, that's really neat. this has uh, been at some expense. Uh, when you want some that have presidential autographs, uh, they don't come cheap. Uh, one of the presidents that I especially revered uh, was Ronald Reagan uh, for, for many reasons. And uh, I had looked and looked, and I've been looking for a long time. And finally, I found a copy of, of his autobiography uh, that had his signature in it. Now, his signature was on one of the little uh, broiler plate type things, you know, where he mm -hmm. saw it and they just pasted it in. But it was a Ronald Reagan signature nonetheless. Because as I've looked around the internet, uh, original signatures by him on some photographs or uh, some bill or letter that he signed can cost in the thousands. I mean, uh, you wow. know, you know, many, sometimes tens of thousands. Yeah. So, so this one was a thousand dollars and I went, I'm going to do it because I wanted to have a <laughs> Ronald Reagan signature uh, uh, in my library. So, wow. But that's the most expensive one I bought, but sometimes the first editions uh, could cost you a couple of hundred dollars. First editions with author autographs. Yeah. Yeah. So while you were reading and, and you were marking inside, would you would you write in the back of the book too, kind of uh, overall thoughts? Or did you have a process for that? Or or was it just kind of notes in the, in the margin of the book? No, I, I never went to the back of the book, oddly enough. And it's funny you should mention that because in, in looking through one of my books the other evening, I noticed that there are a couple of pages in the back that are, are totally blank. And I'm, I'm guessing now that those are left there that you can you can put notes in. But all of mine are in the margins right there okay. by whatever is being discussed. OK. Um, I want I want to hear about some of the main takeaways. Uh, you know, there was a lot of books. It was a 10 year project. You're still you're still doing some of the books. But is there is there one thing uh, I, I end each of my podcast episodes with the one thing I always want to remember from that book or that series of books? Is there one thing that comes to your mind that covers the the entire series? Just one thing that that really struck you about about that that reading project? I guess the one thing that's really stuck with me from from George Washington up to right now is the immense power that comes from that office. And I'm not just talking about in the form of military projection, uh, but, but of the world taken of what presidents in the United States say and mm. do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just very, very captivating how some presidents have have used that. Uh, some could care less, but I think those that were more intuitive about it, or that really understood what sort of projection they make as as they make statements, or go to meetings, that everything they do has a meaning to somebody in some way, shape, or form. 
Yeah. And, uh, it, it's just, uh, and, and so I look at that, you know, and sometimes just a gesture, you know, after they've been asked a question, I, I take special meanings out of it now, you know, such mm. as, you know, why'd you ask me such a dumb question, you know, or, or you could see that they really get into it. And so you can kind of tell what, what their focus is as they execute their responsibilities as president. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I also remember uh, probably like midway through, um, midway through you doing this project, you and I were talking one time and, and you, you mentioned that you just you couldn't believe how many successive presidents had treated the Indians so poorly, the 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 Native Americans here, how poorly they were treated, but just across so many different presidents. And I, and I always remember that sticking out, too, with um, when, when you were when you were doing the project. Um, any anything to say about that? Well, yeah. And I, I I don't know if this is urban legend or not, but I'm told that Indians who truly appreciate their culture and understand uh, their history uh, will not carry a $20 bill in their wallets because it's got wow. a picture of Madison on it. Hmm. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. Am I getting mixed up? Sometimes I do. Yeah. Uh, uh, so... We, we've never, ever, as, as best I can tell, done right by the Indians. Uh, only recently, as of late, and it's sort of like, you know, making amends to them, have we let them operate uh, casinos on their land, which mm -hmm. has certainly been a source of, of great revenue for them. I don't know how they dispense it within their respective tribes or anything. But you know it's small recompense, but mm. it was it was sad to uh, to read about you know just some of the ways that we hunted them down and mm. took them and and made them like cattle and said okay here's your reservation and it totally destroyed their way of life and the, they were able to maintain their a lot of their culture but you know as 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 we just went in and hunted, you know, without thought and killed just for furs rather than it being, you know, uh, a, an annual source of, of food or clothing for them with the way that they'd hunt buffalo mm -hmm. or, or other skinned type animals. Uh, we did it with reckless abandon just for fortune. They did it as a way of life and respected, mm -hmm. you know, their, their surroundings and, and, and what, what their gods provided to them. Mm. I was always struck by that. Who would you say is the president that surprised you the, the most uh, re reading about them? Oh, goodness. Uh, I'm, I'm getting into a series right now about LBJ. Mm -hmm. And I've, I finished the first of four books that uh, Professor Caro has written. And uh, I don't think that for any of the biographies I've read, has an author gone into as much depth, research, and detail as he has. And mm -hmm. having only just recently finished the first of the four books, uh, I guess I'm, I'm most surprised about what I've learned about uh, LBJ. Uh, some of the things that I'd, I'd read heretofore that were just marginalized I, you know, that I kept in my mind, uh, he's bought out. And I, I didn't realize how incredibly uh, Machiavellian that mm -hmm. LBJ was. Yeah. Any means would justify the ends with him for whatever he was doing, especially when it came to elections. Yeah. Wow. And that started with him at a very early age. So yeah. it was just part of his disposition. But again, you know, I'm, I'm talking about that book specifically right now. Uh, uh, Robert Caro uh, really develops his, uh, his mindset, you know, from a very early age. Initially, uh, LBJ's father was somewhat of a successful businessman. 
and politician serving in the uh, Texas legislature. Uh, but uh, in the end, he suffered and lost everything. And they were, they were, as the expression goes, poorer than church mice. They had mm -hmm. virtually nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. There were times when LBJ wasn't going to get a meal unless it was given to him out of charity by his friends or, or some other source. So he, he came from a very humble background, and I don't think that ever left him. But I think he also saw just how much power you could have if you were in the top position in whatever type of organ, organization. Because yeah. even as a youngster, he was uh, uh, prone to uh, uh, shepherd over guys that were older than him. Hmm. But he, his personality was such that they accepted it. So yeah. here he might be as a 13 year old telling 16, 17 year olds what to do and they do it. Huh? Yeah. And I, I, I was curious what you thought about the, the Caro books so far, especially compared to the other biographies. Cause one of the th things Caro says is he was expecting to only write two paragraphs about LBJ's early life. And he, he moved from Manhattan to the Hill country of Texas to because no one would talk to him because he was from Manhattan. But once he moved to the Hill country of Texas, people opened up. And then there are even other situations with family members to where he would just, he would use really unique measures to, to get information from people. And so this, this two paragraphs he expected turned into a almost a thousand page book about LBJ. I mean, really about LBJ's early life. And I just want, I, I, as I was reading the Carol book, I, I was wondering, do, did other biographers get, did they go this in depth with the presidents that you were reading about or, or is this Caro series kind of a unique, a unique thing uh, amongst the books that you've, you've read about the presidents? Yeah, no, Robert Caro sits on a, on a, a level by himself. I have, hmm. I have read no one uh, who has gone into as much depth and background as he has. But the, the the nice thing about it is he's not he he doesn't his style of writing is not as such that it's it's academic. Yeah. You know, he, he's got his footnotes and he's got his sources, but the way he portrays the story is is still very engaging. I was worried when I first started it that uh, uh, oh geez you know here's these four books and like you said each one of them is near a thousand pages long that it was going to be one of these very tedious processes where you just get bored turning pages, you know, trying to get yeah. through it. But I found it, I found the first book very captivating. And I'm just uh, a few chapters into the, the second book. Uh, but the, the same way, I'm hooked. Yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take me to finish it. Because <laughs> I, I, I try to do a chapter or two a day. So yeah. I hope to maybe have it done by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the one that surprised you the most. Who who's been your least favorite president? <laughs> Goodness, uh, there, there's a bunch, you know, because mm. because you've got uh, kind of three tiers of presidents. Some that were just really good that you liked. Some that were. Uh, in, in that middle group where, yeah, they're okay. But then you've got another third, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that would be there, there, you know, there just wasn't much to them. Yeah. Uh, now they, they did, uh, of course, you know, have a presidency that had, had meaning and, and consequences to it, but it was either the way it was written or the actual history of the person themselves that just didn't do a whole lot for me. So it, 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 you said there's a few at the bottom. Who, what, what are some names that come to your mind of the least least favorite? Uh, I'm gonna open up some of my notes here, if you don't mind. No worries. <laughs> uh, I think I'd probably say you, you hit that group there, you know, with, uh, uh, I didn't think much of Tyler, Fillmore, Pierce. Mm -hmm. uh, those were guys that were just, you know, I didn't get a whole lot from them. But then, yeah, 
But you go through the founding fathers, you know, with, with the first five presidents. Geez, there's just so much history there. Uh, yeah. I was particularly taken back with uh, 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 James Madison. Uh, he was uh, injured during the revolutionary conflict as an aide to George Washington. And wow. uh, I mean, here's a guy, he was 18 years old when he, all those early presidents, I, it just blew my mind for the education that they would have by the age of 15, 16, 17, where they spoke English, French, Greek, Latin, and, and they'd have oratories, uh, debates against themselves while they were in colleges in Latin. And I wow. can't, I can't imagine, you know, uh, but they, they, of course, they didn't have TV and cell phones. So I guess about the, the only enjoyment they really had was, was, was uh, the, the adventure of getting into a book or working on a math problem or looking at something astronomical, but they, were, was that, they were certainly Renaissance men. Was that from school or were these men self-taught? I know like uh, Lincoln, he, he was a self-taught lawyer. Yeah, uh, were Lincoln. a lot of the early ones, were they self-taught or were they, was this happening in, in schools there? Well, you know, for those that early uh, batch that came from Virginia, you know, there was a lot of them that were at, at William and Mary. And uh, I, I think that uh, the greater majority of them certainly went, went to uh, formal education at university or college. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on uh, the opposite spectrum of the ones you, you didn't like, do you have any uh, maybe top one or two favorite presidents after, after reading about all of them? Uh, well, Lincoln's got to be right there. You know, he, he just sort of stands out on a number of different things. And, and I'm particularly enamored also with, with Ronald Reagan. I, I got to see him at an age, you know, where uh, I was more politically involved mm -hmm. than earlier days in my life. But uh, he just exuded so much confidence. And, and there, were, there was just sort of an aura about him when he spoke. Uh, I, I never took him to be deceiving. He uh, always spoke from his heart. And, and I think his vision, you know, of the United States, of America, uh, was, was one that, that, that really helped carry him through his presidency, too. He was mm -hmm. strong-willed, and I, I think people appreciated that on both sides of the aisle. And, and another thing is that I, I, I think following uh, President Reagan and, and his relationship with Tip O'Neill that compromise left our government. Uh, those two at the end of the day could sit down and talk and compromise to get things done. Mm -hmm. but following him, we see that just going, just sliding down the hill to where it is right now, where it's my way or the highway with either of the parties involved. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's very, very disconcerting to me. Yeah. Well, you mentioned some of the character traits of, of Reagan. Uh, what, with, with this being such a powerful position, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, what are the important character traits that someone should have if they're the president? Well, this might sound prejudicial, but I think that they have to have some sort of relationship with God, hmm. uh, whatever name they give to their God, uh, because I think when you've got that, you understand good and bad or good and evil, and it, it, it would hopefully help, you know, mold their character, too. Uh, back when our nation first started, you would see the name of God invoked time after time after time from, from all politicians. It didn't matter what party they belonged to. But... Uh, Nowadays, we, 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 we see God even being pushed out of government, 
out of schools, out of out of everything, you know, for the the sake and benefit of the few. You know, it, it has always been a conundrum to me that majority rule versus minority rights. You know, mm-hmm. and it, when you get that few that are opposed to something, no matter what it might be, and the majority might want to favor something that's that's certainly more respectable, but you've got that minority view that'll be upheld because the Supreme Court says so. And mm-hmm. there's just times like that where it just, uh, it bothers me, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I would I would call myself a conservative and uh, I'm, I don't like to see a lot of things like that changed or abused, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to a relationship with God. And you can see that with a lot of our presidents. Lincoln would get down on his knees. He would get down on his knees and pray and pray out loud uh, for soldiers. And mm-hmm. I, and when he did that, he wasn't just praying that the North was going to win this battle or that battle. He hated the loss of life. It, it bothered him immensely. Wow. Uh, the Doris Carnes Goodwin uh, makes pretty good illustration of that. Uh, as as he would at night, many times sit there by the uh, the Morse code guy, you know, waiting for a message to come in. What wow. happened at this battle? You know, uh, and he while well, he hated to hear it. How many how many souls did we lose today? But wow. he was that that concerned, you know, about, of course, about preservation of, 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 of our nation, but, but also with the loss of life. Wow. Uh, how, how can we get to know pre, uh, candidates? So when, when we're coming up to an election, what's the best way that you saw through, through these books. So knowing, you know, the the people's early lives, and maybe that didn't come out until after they were dead or after, you know, after they were president, how, what's the best way to gauge who would make a good president based on what we know, what we can get to know about them at the time? Well, uh, with all the information that's there on the internet, you probably have to be a bit discerning, but I think you can find out an awful lot there. Not from just what the person is saying, but many times you can go back and see their positions on different things. Uh, <laughs> like I, before this particular election, I personally went back to read some things about, at that point, candidate Biden. And uh, he was very, very, very much a segregationist whether anybody wants to believe that right now or not. Uh, he, he literally voted against anything and everything that, that had to do with segregation, but he certainly doesn't uh, portend that sort of view right now. So I think one of the things is certainly you can, you can go back and find out a lot about people right now uh, with newspaper articles that might have been written about them, uh, little vignettes that might be in magazines and what have you. But, but aside from listening to them as a candidate, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, what makes a good? It's kind of tied to what we what you were saying. But what what makes a good president? Is it is it someone who does the will of the people? Is 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 it someone who goes goes in with their mind made up on what they're going to do, and then they just try to do that? Is it a compromiser? Is it uh, what makes a a good president after after you've seen the full gam- gambit of them? Well, when you listen to candidates talk about what they want to do and what their what their vision is, I think that's important because it should be the blueprint for what their presidency would be about. Uh, so I I look for that. But I think the one of the most important things right now is that you do find someone who is a compromiser. You need someone that can heal, that, that can come to these different divisions and say, okay, I, you know, we want this much money, but 
listen to the other side and see what their their concerns are for how much money you want as president and what you'd be willing to give in on to get to some happy medium. We don't see that anymore. It just mm. doesn't happen. You know, and it, it's mere tokenism for any small amounts that are given out right now, which, which would bring me to the the incredible amounts of money we've been printing for the last few years. Hmm. But uh, I think that's important. And uh, I, th I think that, uh, and once again, this is just a personal opinion. I think you need to have someone that uh, they, they don't need to necessarily wear their religion on their sleeve, but, but someone who is, is grounded and at peace with their God. Because I don't think that unless you are at peace with your God that you can truly care about the souls that you are responsible for. Hmm. That's, and that's just a, a deep personal conviction I've got. But you see that with not all the presidents. And, uh, but I, I, I like seeing the presidents that are going to uh, a religious service, not just on Christmas and Easter, but, mm -hmm. you know, every chance they get when they're home on a Sunday for whatever church they might select in the D.C. area. I love seeing them walking out of there with their wife, you know, with their Bible in hand and going down and getting in there their motorcade and driving away. And I think that's reinforcing to the population when they see that too, because they know someone who's, who's should be caring about them, whether they really uh, have had other thoughts or not. When you see something like that, it, it, it at least makes me more content, regardless of party. Well, and as part of it too, just the, the power of the position, acknowledging that there's something higher than that, uh, that, Otherwise, it could just be so easy to, to, to go down that road of, of have, having so much power that you, you just get sucked into that. And, and um, yeah, do you think part, 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 of, part of why you're, why you say that is, is that, that reason as well, just to have something that's above, above you and not just, uh, well, I'm now in the highest position I can. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I, I think that's what helps temper their decisions at critical junctures or, or points where forces to be brought into play, uh, especially as we look at the Middle East right now. I think that there are times where uh, when something's happened where I go, oh, blow that up, you know. But, but we've had presidents who here in the recent past, you know, have, have – uh, have taken their time and I think listened to the advisors and counselors that they have around them rather than just, you know, spurting off on their own and pushing the button saying, well, I'll go ahead, you know, shoot some missiles at that place and blow it up. Mm -hmm. so I, I think we're, we're genuinely being guarded with, with our force projection. Okay. Um, this this podcast is, is built around a reading project of selecting books and, and reading through them. You did a quite a project with reading through all the, the books of the presidents. I know some people listening will want to do a similar project, maybe not all the presidents, but maybe like you did, uh, starting with the president of that was there at their birth um, and then going forward, or maybe starting with the first five presidents. What, what would you suggest to somebody who wants to do a project like this? Uh, anything that that you might do different, or just any suggestions in general on on doing a project about the presidents uh, by reading books about them? Oh gosh, I think uh, looking back on it, I I liked the decision I made to go forward from the time I was born to get me current, hmm. and then going back and starting starting with. Uh, with with George Washington, uh, it, 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 that that offered me a good perspective, because because even for what things were done prior to uh, FDR, it 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 helped me understand better what what I've lived through and what mm -hmm. I'm, what we're going through right now. 
So I'd, I'd be partial to that. Uh, start with, with the president you were born under and then go forward, then go back, you know, but that's just a personal opinion. And then did you find the autobiographies to be better or the biographies just kind of in, in general? I know particularly mm -hmm. it'd, it'd be different, but any mm -hmm. suggestion there just on, on an overall to, to maybe go with biographies over autobiographies or vice versa? I'd go with biographies. Okay. I, I really would. You know, uh, uh, Bill Clinton's autobiography was a bit... Uh, I, I think that that some some of the presidents who've done autobiographies, at least the, the autobiographies that I've read, uh, try try to make excuses where there might have been a problem, or try to aggrandize themselves more than they should for accomplishments that they've had. <clears throat> I like the presidents who use we rather than me or mm. I, because uh, yeah. it's, it's a team effort when you get up, get up there, you know, and, and for those that realize that and, and uh, use their cabinet that way, I, I think we're, we're tended to be better presidents. Yeah. Well, interesting. Well, so neat to hear about the project and, and just to, to know you through throughout the project and kind of hear different snippets of it and, I appreciate you sharing uh, what what you've learned and some of the high and low points in terms of the presidents and and overall takeaways. So, thanks for uh, thanks for joining and and um, we'll we'll be sure I'll be sure to get the the full list from you as well, and so we can include that in the uh, in the show notes. Can I uh, make one more comment about presidents? Yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, I I've always had this feeling about. Uh, one specific individual that was the president I wish to see be president more than anyone else. And uh, so I've done some some reading about her, and that's Condoleezza Rice. <clears throat> and I would, uh, I've got her on my list just because <laughs> I think she would have been an incredible president. Wow. Yeah. And, and why? What, what, are, what were the character traits of, of her that, that, make you say that <clears throat> not because she's black not because she's a woman but her judgment and i've heard her speak in person a number of times and have met her and spoken to her uh we're, we're just a, as good as you could possibly imagine i think she had a, a very keen mind a very good understanding of what this country stands for and where we where we stand in the world uh and and she was just grounded in so many other ways i mean if you've ever seen i've, I've never seen her in person play the piano but i've watched her on on the internet and that can sit down and ha has the capacity to remember and play the, the 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 concert pieces that she play and play them beautifully you just sit there in awe and aside from that, every time I heard her speak, no notes, no podium, she's out there with the people. And everything she says comes from that very keen, deliberate mind that she's got. And uh, I think she was just a brilliant woman. And it, uh, it pained me for, uh, for parts of her life. That, that she lived through that I think helped uh, give her a perspective on where we were growing as a society. Some of the, a couple of the little girls who were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church in uh, Birmingham, Alabama were friends of hers. Wow. Uh, Condoleezza Rice's father was a preacher and, but, but she knew them. And I, I think that, specific incident had a very real effect on on how she saw relations among amongst different races you know yeah. but uh there, there was never any prejudice on her part because of any of that uh but she saw the need for healing wow. and understanding and uh so aside from her just being absolutely brilliant 
would she have been president? Yeah. But, uh, oh, but I got to speak to her that one time, actually twice, both times at the Masters Golf Tournament. Members hmm. of the Augusta National Club have to have a duty that they do there each year for the Masters. And one year, she was uh, a greeter at one of the putting greens. So you stand in line, you get up there, and the greens are exact replicas of the ones that are on the course. So okay. when you make a putt, you get a real appreciation for speed and the, the contours of the green and everything else. But I digress. But but she was there greeting for that. But I didn't get – that was just sort of a high and by. But the next year, she was a greeter, and we were there as soon as the gates opened. And I didn't know she was going to be there. But she was a greeter at uh, – Oh, I can't remember this one special pl place that we got to go into where you could get all your beverages for free, your meals for free. And there was nobody there. So I, I said, I said, can I talk to you for a moment? She said, well, certainly. She's very, very engaging, very nice. I said, you've always been my, my choice to be president. And wow. she looked at me and smiled, and I'll never forget her response. She said, I don't need to read about myself in the newspapers anymore, so I think <laughs> I'm going to let that go by. <laughs> Condoleezza Rice. Wow. So who are the other presidents you've met, and then who are the presidents that you served under? Well, I served under uh, initially LBJ. Hmm. So we've got LBJ, we've got uh, Nixon, we've got uh, Ford, we've got Carter. Uh, uh, but the only ones that I have met personally are uh, President Carter. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to be able at one point in time to go to the Carter Center and have my picture taken with him. Which and is a great, great photo. I'm in an assembly line. So when I get up to him, and I purposely had worn this one lapel pin because while he was president, I was a company commander in the 101st Airborne Division. And I got up to him and I said, I said, Mr. President, you might not remember me, but you were my boss for a couple of years. <laughs> I said, I was in the Army while you were Commander-in-Chief, and he just smiled. <laughs> yeah. That's great. But uh, a great man. And, and speaking of Jimmy Carter, uh, I, I would say this about him. I didn't think a whole lot of him as president, but living here in Atlanta, I was, I was invited – to be uh, one of the people on the board of counselors for the Carter Center. And they include the entire uh, uh, consular corps. And I'm sort of an adjunct member of that as sort of the ranking guy he here in the city for Hong Kong. And that's the closest relationship that anybody's got with it, anything that has to do with China here. Uh, so I've been able to go there and, and, and listen to him for years now. And I've got such an appreciation for, for that center, for the mm -hmm. good that they do around the world, that uh, that'll be his legacy. And, and he'll, he'll have a nice place in heaven for, for what he's done for humanity. Wow. He and Rosalind. Yeah. He and Rosalind. And of course, That's he's great. moving up in years now, 93 years old. So, yeah. Wow. Well, thanks, Gene. Any, any other parting thoughts? Nothing I can think of at the moment. Well, thanks for, thanks for joining. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Eric. Adios. All right. That's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought of this episode or other ones. I heard from somebody else who is who had has also read a book about each of the presidents when I was posting that I was doing this interview. If you know of somebody or if you, you have also done that, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to uh, include your reading list of the president's books in the show notes as well, just so we can kind of have a different different lists if somebody's interested in, in doing this themselves they can see what uh, different people have read for a book about each of the presidents 
Uh, you can also follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter at Books of Titans. And my website is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back in, in two weeks discussing another book or another series of books from this year's reading list. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out. Thank you.